Shakespeare to, tr to try and set the scene with a little bit of Arabic. And I will begin to read, this is actually chapter two that I'm reading from, Marhaba. Now you've probably heard Assalamu Alaikum, which means basically sort of like a peace be with you. Wa Alaikum As Salaam is the response, which is sort of like also with you. I know, I'm making it sound very Catholic. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Anyway, um, so uh, Marhaba is the hello, and it's secular and vaguely unfriendly, not a good substitute for Salaam Alaikum. So, Doha, Qatar, June 2004. Qatar greeted me with a wall of sticky sea air, so intense it took my breath away. I'd done my research. This was a business trip after all. I wasn't surprised when the captain announced the temperature outside, 110 degrees, ideal for melting chocolate. But until I tried to suck it in, I had no idea what that kind of era is like. The Qatari Peninsula is so narrow in some spots, you can cross it in about 45 minutes. Air traveling over that sand was practically sweating. I know I was. No one of the locals on the plane had begun to douse up on heavy cologne as we cleared for landing. The chilled black Mercedes that shuttled us from the tarmac to the terminal offered welcome respite for the entire 10 seconds it took to beeline it to the entrance. Then the waiting at customs, then another Mercedes. I couldn't wait to experience the exotic landscape I'd been imagining. Qatar, or I guess at that point I would have said Qatar. A word that evokes a whiff of incense and the rustle of a belly dancer's scarves as long as I ignore the correct pronunciation, which would turn out to be more telling. Get it? Cutter. Anyway, we landed around midnight, so my new home remained shrouded in mystery as we sped from the airport to the hotel. Immediately obvious, however, were the waves of nausea that swept over me. For the first time in my life, I was experiencing car sickness. Traffic in Doha, it does not meet at four corner intersections, but roundabouts, ginormous circles that divide the world into two types of drivers, the enraged and the terrified. <laughs> the former seemed hell-bent on passing through these crossings without slowing down, whereas the latter, which our driver turned out to be a monk, lacked the requisite aggression to exit. This meant we sloshed around multiple times <laughs> before being spit out in another direction. By the time we got to the hotel, I had no idea where I was in relation to the airport. Side note, that's a little disingenuous because I have a terrible sense of direction anyway. <laughs> a light from the vehicle led to instant, if short-lived, relief as that wave of hot air hit us again. This is unbelievable, Kyle, my boss and companion for this trip, said as she pushed a wisp of frosted blonde hair off her forehead. Interestingly, I had two bosses. Actually, I had three, but two that I talked about a lot, Kyle and Robbie, both ladies. Um, so, she said as she pushed a wisp of frosted blonde hair off her forehead. I thought it would be a dry desert heat. I watched as she adjusted her bangles and rings and necklaces, all sticking to the sheet of perspiration that had broken out. Somewhere in her 40s, Kyle worked harder than most 20-year-olds I knew. I wondered how, in addition to the job, the daughter, and the husband, she found the time to put together the trendy outfit, complete with exotic jewelry. The only thing I had the time for was the business end of the gap. Looks I accessorized as sparsely as the clothes demanded. Now I get why the Lonely Planet says the best time to visit was the Ice Age, I said. It feels like we're standing in front of a clothes dryer. That's really what it said. If you looked up Cutter in the Lonely Planet Guide, you know how it says best time to visit? It said the Ice Age. The reception desk inside was another story. It felt like the inside of a meat locker. I was glad I'd been warned to dress conservatively, covering my elbows and knees at all times. Like, this would be way too slutty to get up to wear. Uh, blah, 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 blah. But uh, made a mental note to ask my husband Jeff to bring some sweaters out of storage when he came to join me. I'd be needing them if I was going to live here. Not that the university had actually offered me the marketing director position yet, but when they did, I would be taking it and we would be moving to Doha. It was not yet public knowledge, but the newspaper where Jeff worked had just filed for bankruptcy. The industry was grim, newspapers simply weren't hiring. And that just sort of goes on with what I said for you guys before. So I was thinking in my mind, once the three-year contract they hadn't offered yet was up, I would get to take some time off and work on my writing. He'd have become so successful, I could step back from the financial reins and get started on that family. We were perfect partners like that. In the meantime, I had to impress my boss-to-be. Not an easy task. Because 
she was a workaholic, I'm telling you. So here we go to chapter three, and this chapter is called The Weddings. And I started with a little uh, bit about Habibi Habiti, uh, which are the masculine and feminine terms of endearment, meaning dear one. You know, as a Baltimore waitress might use the word hun. <laughs> So, Doha, Qatar, June 2004. It was growing dark as Kyle and I left Muhammad's office and headed back to our hotel, but I searched the landscape anyway. What struck me about this new place, what I could see of it whizzing past the car's plate glass, was how little there was to see. Roads stretched between roundabouts, populated with single-story shops, topped by garish plastic signs, and no people, except in other cars. Beyond the roads were vast expanses of nothingness, desert, flat, and interminable looking. It called to mind a moonscape, what I imagined the moon would look like if everything came in shades of beige. I wondered if Cutter's ruling family actually ordered that the building should be tan, but later understood that everything was just leaped of color by the unrelenting sun and sand dust that never washed away. The most significant aspect of the landscape was the construction. Everything on the verge of enormous change. There's some pictures in the back of the book, too. There was no getting to Zen, I, and I felt compelled to join this effervescent frenzy of becoming. Little did I know I was in Buddhist boot camp. Hey, look at that, Kyle said as we headed to our rooms. She was pointing to an easel announcing the graduation ceremony for Virginia Commonwealth, another undergraduate campus, another undergraduate university in Cutter. The campus where we were was called Education City. Terrible naming. Let's go snoop, she said. We had been at it since a 6.30 a.m. breakfast meeting, and it was now almost 8 p.m. That our school was only on the verge of opening, and it would be a good four years before we had any graduates, did not deter Kyle. We just tacked another week onto our stay. I miss my husband, and what I really wanted to do was slink away for a surreptitious cigarette. Great idea, I smiled. I'd love to see it. It wasn't a total lie. I was curious about what went on under those abayas, the long black robes worn by women in the Gulf. And since VCU's enrollment was all female, I thought we were in for a display. Jewels and flashes of color poked out from under those robes, and I knew somebody somewhere had to be shopping at the plethora of designer stores in Doha. Women everywhere were eager to show off their purchases to other women, but here, the only time it was acceptable to do so was in their exclusive company. And so, we peeked inside the set of massive doors to find about 700 people sitting stock still as speakers droned on. Unfortunately, the gathering included fathers, husbands, brothers, and sons decked out in their starch white thobes and red and white check headgear, so the women stayed under wraps. Looks like commencement, Kyle said with a smirk. So then it goes on a bit, and what happens is we find ourselves in, in a wedding. <laughs> like, we're walking down the hallway, and we hear this music coming, floating out through the door. Habibi! And we look, I'm a terrible singer, and um, there was a, uh, a, a wedding happening. We saw this clutch of women in the black robes float into these doors, and we knew it was a wedding because women, you didn't see women out especially not in a place where they serve alcohol, like a hotel, without their husbands. So we were like, it's a wedding. So again, we rushed up to the doors to try and get a peek like we'd done at BCU. And to this time, to our shock, this woman beckoned us in. And this is the universal Asian hand gesture for come on in, come, come. <clears throat> Once inside, I practically had to shield my eyes the gold lame trimmings, the exotic flower arrangements, the outfits. Since men have their own connubial shindig, those black wraps were off. Now, I didn't have to wear an abaya, but looking conservative at all times for non-shoppers such as myself meant I basically sported business casual when I wasn't wearing a full-on suit. That evening, I had on a brown silk jacket with three-quarter length sleeves, tan capri pants, and black flats. For the first time in Cutter, I felt underdressed and overclothed. The over-the-top couture styles made me feel like I had invaded a runway show during Fashion Week, and the makeup was as thick as the gold jewelry. What struck me the most, however, was the sound of the women talking. Most of the people I interacted with, at the office, in shops, or in cabs, were men. Their Arabic had a sharp, guttural tone. But here in this room, I knew they had to be speaking the same language, but it sounded so delicate and so feminine. 
It was entirely different. Not that anyone was talking to us exactly. Very quickly, I began to feel like I had felt at so many other weddings, awkward. So we edged to the back of the room, and I'll skip ahead just a little bit, and oh, 